Well, hey there. Uh, we got a few more minutes till you guys get to experience Genesis, so uh, gonna need something for you guys to do. Hey, Ralph. Yo. The vision of this film, what are you hoping to accomplish? We're trying to show that the Bible is true, but also the science to yes. back it up. If we're gonna have a debate about science, can you please just be honest about it? Ologia presents The Science of Genesis, Paradise Lost. Part 10, Natural Selection Selects. If you're new to the series, click on the I in the top corner to watch from the beginning. Many textbooks say, again with textbooks? What is the obsession with textbooks? The peppered moth industrial melanism in England is evolution. Well, if that's all evolution is, I believe. That's not all evolution is? But a common definition of biological evolution is the change in allele frequencies in a population over time, where allele refers to the variant forms of a gene sequence. So the peppered moth situation is an example of evolution, but it is not all it is. The dark colored peppered moths actually were more camouflaged than the light colored peppered moths. As a result, the birds could see them and eat them for lunch a lot easier. It's not an evolutionary event at all. It's a natural selection event. It is commonly explained that evolution is a process that takes place by means of genetic variation and natural selection. Charles is right to say that biological evolution and natural selection are not synonyms for each other, but that the latter is a contributor to the former. Just like bread isn't synonymous with a sandwich, but bread contributes to a sandwich. So Charles might have a point in identifying an event as demonstrating the natural selection mechanism only. We'll have to see where he goes with this. Natural selection means to pick or choose, to select from what is already there. Traits that were already there, genetic information that was already there. So far, so good. This process will never get you from uh, copepod sort of things in the ocean turning into moths. It will never get you from monkeys turning into people. This process can't make one step in that. Just like bread alone doesn't make a sandwich, natural selection alone doesn't equal evolution. As Charles notes, for some reason, Charles is missing the genetic variation half of the explanation. When organisms reproduce, there are typically mutations in the DNA. For example, it is estimated that each human has, on average, 60 to 100 mutated differences from our parents' DNA. Most of these mutations end up being neutral, having no noticeable effect. Sometimes, the mutation ends up being harmful to the organism. Other times, the mutation might give the organism some kind of advantage in life in their current environment. It is upon these advantageous genetic mutations that natural selection acts. Organisms with an advantage will have more children. Therefore, those advantage alleles will eventually become more common. Natural selection may be able to explain the survival of the fittest, but it cannot explain the arrival of the fittest. Just a note that the phrase survival of the fittest doesn't necessarily have anything to do with strength or power. Instead, it has everything to do with adaptation to an environment to have more offspring. Longer fur might be an advantage in a cold climate and a disadvantage in a hot climate. How did we get moths in the first place is the question evolution claims to answer and can't and doesn't. So Charles started this segment by insisting that natural selection alone isn't the same as evolution, which is partially correct. But now he's done a complete 180 by saying that because natural selection alone doesn't explain something, therefore evolution can't explain that thing. Going back to our sandwich analogy, Charles said that bread isn't a sandwich. And because bread alone isn't a sandwich, then a sandwich can't be a sandwich. The types of changes that we're seeing that lead to variation with kinds. Variation within kinds is creationist code for any evolutionary observations that humans have documented, so it would be difficult to deny. Things like the domestication of the dog from wolves, selective breeding to produce modern bananas or broccoli, or bacteria developing resistance to antibiotics. Are not the types of changes that are required by evolution. There is variation within the kind, but not evolution of one kind becoming another kind. Since creationists can no longer deny that evolution is an observable phenomenon in modern day, and not merely guesses about the past, they've chosen to embrace the idea to certain extents, and now often speak of created kinds. In the creation account, it says that God created according to their kind after their kind. The idea is that God created a relatively small number of organisms during creation week, maybe 8,000 or so distinct kinds, and that small number were preserved on Noah's Ark. But then after the flood, the offspring of these kinds began to rapidly produce variations into all the species of animals we see today. 
By one estimate, this hypervariation would have had to have produced 11 new species every single day just to account for it all. Where various methods like genetics, morphology, and the fossil record produce independent yet corroborating phylogenetic trees that demonstrate a single tree of life and how all life on the planet share common ancestors, the creationist model posits an orchard of life, where God is said to have made the base kinds independently of each other, but phylogenetic trees offshoot from each of those seemingly arbitrary breaks. The trouble is that there are clear genetic connections between these root nodes that bear monology, the fancy name for the study of created kinds, proposes, and these connections include specific mutations and precisely located virus-caused damage, shared by different nodes, and cannot be reasonably explained away as the work of a common designer. Not through evolutionary process. You don't have one kind developing into another kind. They're all created according to their kind. Georgia is positing that no node from one branch in the orchard would be born so different from its parent that it couldn't be part of the same tree in their diagram. The featured speakers in this film seem to be under the mistaken impression that such an event would be predicted with the single tree evolutionary model, but this couldn't be further from the truth, and we will talk more about this perpetuated misconception momentarily. At this point though, I would note the frustration many have with the lack of definition of created kind, and that without precise definition it seems that the claim that one kind cannot change to another kind is impossible to either refute or verify. One might as well argue that a pile can never become a mound, but refusing to attach measurable definitions to either word. Yes, you can have great variation within a kind, you can get different species forming, which is what Darwin really saw. Again, the movie is forced to acknowledge that we have observed speciation events in nature. This is when two populations are descendants from a single population, but have changed so much that they are no longer able to interbreed. Geographical separation of the two populations over an extended period of time is a common factor. Examples of modern speciation documented by science include three-spined sticklebacks, north and south rim Grand Canyon squirrels, and the London underground mosquito. One of my favorite new species appeared only in the last year, a crayfish whose genetic mutation gave it the ability to have babies without male involvement. Essentially, she gives birth to clones of herself, and she's taking over European waterways. Cool, right? But there are limits. I'm curious as to what these limits are. What is the chemical or biological mechanism that stops these so-called variations from going too far? Articles like this one at Answers in Genesis assert the same claim, that genetic variation has limits, but it neither specifies the boundaries nor even suggests how such a boundary is enforced. Let's say that a genetic mutation that leads to a variation in a population represents a single step. The movie's speakers would acknowledge that some variations in nature must represent at least two steps, maybe three, maybe four, five. If a person can take five steps, they can simply repeat that until they've walked a mile and walk across the country. What would such a journey be other than a series of single steps? If there is something preventing variation steps from accumulating into a significant evolutionary journey, what is that something? Can it be demonstrated? How does it work? Dogs always remain dogs. Cats always remain cats. I presume that when Ken and other creationists say that dogs will always remain dogs, that they're deliberately, or accidentally, implying that evolution would claim something otherwise. That evolution predicts that non-dogs would come from dogs. But this couldn't be further from the truth. A dog giving birth to a non-dog would completely invalidate biological evolution. Let's explore a few analogies, though admittedly imperfect ones, to see if we can clear up this confusion just a little. If you use a computer, you've undoubtedly worked with a folder-based file system. If you have a top folder A, you could make subfolders B, C, and D, all of which are part of folder A. If you make some subfolders in B, perhaps B1, B2, and B3, those are all in folder B, but are also still part of folder A. Subfolder C1 would also be a part of A, but not a part of B. Yet another layer of subfolders, B1A and B1B, are, unsurprisingly, still a part of B1, B, and A. And you would never expect to make a subfolder in B1B that was somehow also a subfolder of D. So it is with evolution. Every organism inherits from all the organisms in the nodes before it. But no organism just jumps to an entirely different branch. We know that in the 3rd century, there were a group of Europeans who spoke a language called Latin. Over the course of the centuries, 
these Latin speakers moved to different parts of the continent, and their languages adapted independently into branches including Italian, Spanish, and French. Despite the common Latin history, the French and the Spanish could eventually no longer understand each other. At no point in this history did a set of Latin-speaking parents raise a Spanish-speaking baby. Yet Spanish is obviously descended from Latin. Suppose a group of French speakers left to colonize Mars, and we were to visit them in, say, 500 years. They would likely be speaking a language called Martien. They would not be fully understood by earthbound French speakers, but would be obviously derived from French. Yet at no point on that journey would a French speaker give birth to a Martian speaker. And so it is with evolution. Anyone who thinks that dogs don't give birth to non-dogs is an evolution-refuting statement, is drastically confused about the claims that evolution makes, and should sincerely seek out a better understanding of what an evolutionist actually believes. Suppose you have a friend whose favorite color is blue, and you would like them to join you in having orange as the favorite color. If you were to spend your time telling your blue-loving friend how terrible green is, they'd become confused, annoyed, and likely never see your point of view on the greatness of orange. You have to accurately know and address someone's actual opinion if you care to change their mind. The fact of the matter is the information is stronger than it's been ever in the past five years. There's been a quantum jump in the data, the new discoveries that actually go against evolutionary thinking and make it more and more preposterous. It would have been nice if you would have pointed to some examples, Charles, rather than asking us to take you at your word. What is this new data? Is Eric saving this data for a sequel so you're trying to avoid spoilers? The creationists are finding more and more ammunition in the new scientific data, not theories, in the data, which prompted Eugenie Scott to say, facts are a dime a dozen. Theories are what matter in science. Anytime an expert is quoted, particularly an expert who disagrees with the person doing the quoting, it's a good idea to check the context of the quote. What does Eugenie Scott have to say about facts and theories? You know, the terms that we use in science are used very specifically in science as terms of art, but they have very different meanings on the street, and this is a source of a lot of confusion. When scientists talk about fact, they're talking about confirmed observations, and facts are interesting, but they're not terribly exciting. They don't, they don't do a whole lot for you. Facts are a dime a dozen. There's facts all over the place. A hypothesis is a testable statement. You're saying, you know, what's the relationship between this and this? And you go out and test it, and you either accept or reject your, your uh, statement of that relationship. Hypotheses are very useful. They're very helpful. Uh, they, they help us build theory. Theories are the most important things in science. Theory to a scientist means explanation. And these are logical constructs of, of facts, of tested hypotheses, of laws, of all kinds of stuff that taken together and put in a logical descriptive fashion help us understand some kind of natural phenomenon. Most lay people think that theories are guesses or hunches or something that you don't have to take terribly seriously. It's not such a big deal. Completely opposite in science. Theories are the most important things in science. What a lot of, unfortunately, textbooks lead people to, to misunderstand is that a really good theory grows up into a law, as if uh, theories are, are refined and then become laws, and laws are somehow more important than theories. In science, actually, laws are just descriptive generalizations. They're very useful. They're very helpful. They're not as important as theories, because theories explain laws. So in general, the, uh, the, the hierarchy of explanation is very different in science than it is in the general public. The general public puts, puts facts on top, laws next, um, hypotheses, and then theories. Maybe theories and hypotheses can move around a little bit. In science, on the other hand, theories are the most important thing. Laws are next most important. Uh, hypotheses are next mo most important. And perhaps the least most important part of a scientific explanation is facts, because facts are a dime a dozen. And facts don't explain anything. Here's why we believe this, and it's not just faith. We have science. It's really on our side. This is a particularly bold statement in the context of a section of the film that put forth no scientific findings whatsoever to support a creationist framework, but instead merely stomped its feet in incredulity at a misrepresentation of a model with unprecedented explanatory and predictive power. But they had to include the line in the movie. It was in all the trailers. Next on the Science of Genesis Paradise Lost. Part 11, Planet of the Ape Men. Tap the subscribe button and the bell icon so you don't miss it. If you'd like to support the work of Apologia, please consider becoming a patron at the link in the description. Thanks for watching.